Hi, welcome to TSI's Open Course in Conservation Genomics for Threatened Species Management. My name is Lauren White. I'm a molecular ecologist at the Arthur Ryler Institute for Environmental Research, and I'll be taking you through module 1.4, Restoring Gene Flow. This module, I'll first describe what I mean by gene flow and then talk about the impact that human activities have had on gene flow and the consequences that this has for threatened species. I'll describe how restoring gene flow can overcome some of these negative impacts and the strategies for doing so. Finally, I'll talk about some of the risks that are inherent in restoring gene flow and how they should be weighed up against the risk of not taking action at all. The gene flow is the transfer of genetic material from one population to another through the migration and interbreeding of individuals from different groups. Gene flow includes lots of different kinds of events, such as pollen or seeds being blown to a new destination by the wind or carried to a new area by animals. Another example is when individuals of certain species leave the social group in which they were born to join a new group, or even when people move to new cities or countries. Gene flow occurs at different rates. So at one end of this spectrum, when gene flow is very high, two groups of individuals may more appropriately be considered a single population as genetic variants will be exchanged often and our ability to genetically differentiate between the two groups will be low. On the other end of the spectrum, when gene flow is low or non-existent, separated populations will mutate, evolve and drift independently, a process called divergence in which the separated populations will become genetically differentiated. The rate at which genetic differences accumulate between populations will be inversely uh, related to the amount of gene flow. So divergence will be slower when gene flow is greater. After two groups have been separated for a number of generations, allowing genetic differences to accumulate, restoring gene flow can be a means of increasing genetic diversity and thus an important source of genetic variation. Now, for many species, human activities such as deforestation and urbanization have not only caused dramatic declines in population size, but have also led to significant reduction in gene flow between the fragmented populations. For example, Australia has three species of wombats, which have all suffered declines since European invasion. The population of the two hairy nosed wombats in particular, as you can see on this map, are extremely fragmented compared to their former distribution. The combined effects of populations being small and isolated is, as we've said, the increased divergence between these populations, but also the loss of genetic diversity and increased inbreeding. This can lead to a loss of adaptive potential and potentially inbreeding dep depression, all of which increases a species risk of extinction. In many cases, these negative effects can at least be partially alleviated by restoring gene flow between populations. Restoring gene flow between, by connecting isolated populations is gonna reduce the divergence between those populations. It'll increase the genetic diversity within those populations. And by introducing unrelated individuals into the population, it can reduce inbreeding. So in doing so, restoring gene flow can alleviate inbreeding depression and thus elevate population growth. This is sometimes referred to as genetic rescue. It, by increasing genetic diversity, restoring gene flow can also increase adaptive potential, enabling populations to more readily respond to environmental change. And this is sometimes called evolutionary rescue. There's a variety of ways that gene flow between populations can be restored. For example, just by restoring critical habitat. This refers to the process of reviving or improving ecosystems that have been damaged, degraded or destroyed. It involves activities like removing pollutants or an invasive species and reintroducing native plants and animals, restoring natural waterways and improving soil health. Uh, this can enhance gene flow by connecting populations that, uh, uh, that are separated by a barrier and promoting population growth and expansion into previously unoccupied areas. Another method of restoring gene flow is through constructing artificial structures like wildlife corridors. These are linear pathways that connect fragmented areas and facilitate animal movement. So some examples of wildlife corridors in Australia are the glider poles and bridges erected over the Hume Highway, uh, fishways, which are structures built around dams or other obstacles that allow fish to disperse around these artificial barriers, 
And finally, tunnels built over roads uh, for the annual red crop migration on Christmas Island. In urban environments, green spaces such as green roofs, vertical gardens or nature strips can provide habitat for plants, insects, birds and even small mammals. These serve as, these serve as gene flow stepping stones for wildlife and dispersing plants to move between. Finally, translocations are an intensive but powerful means of restoring and enhancing gene flow between populations. This refers to the deliberate movement of individual organisms from one location to another and can increase gene flow by mixing animals from two geographically separated groups. So the poster child for translocation and genetic rescue in Australia is the mountain pygmy possum. Uh, in the late 90s, it was realized that the mount Buller population of this species had collapsed and was suffering from very low genetic diversity and high inbreeding. So males from a much larger population of the species were moved into Mount, Bull Mount Buller. And this resulted in an increase in genetic diversity, but also a rapid turnaround in their population growth, probably because inbreeding depression was alleviated. Gene flow between isolated populations can also be promoted during reintroduction programs in which animals are translocated into areas which, from which they've been previously lost. So for example, the burrowing betong or booty was reintroduced to a fenced reserve at Arid Recovery in South Australia in the late 90s. The source populations for this reintroductions were two isolated populations off the Western Australian coast. Uh, these the source populations were quite inbred. By mixing individuals from these two different groups though, the descendant arid recovery population has heaps lower inbreeding and higher diversity than either of the two source populations. So gene flow has been restored between the two island populations at arid recovery, where booties continue to thrive. So restoring gene flow is clearly a valuable conservation strategy. However, it's not without risks for which, um, which should be carefully assessed during planning of any projects aiming to restore gene flu. So for example, if individuals from one, po uh, one population carry pathogens to which the recipient population has little or no immunity, can result in disease outbreaks and population declines. Uh, secondly, moving individuals from one group to another may disrupt lo local social structures and negatively impact either the source or the recipient population. Introducing individuals from outside a population may dilute or overwhelm unique genetic characteristics of the recipient population. Now, at what point a population should be considered unique enough to require separate management, where gene flow from other closely related groups should be avoided? It's a somewhat difficult and complicated question, which is actually covered in much more detail in the next module of this series. Finally, translocation programs should carefully consider the risks of over-harvesting source populations. The number of individuals taken from a source population shouldn't be high enough to negatively impact the sustainability of that population. To minimize these risks, programs that aim to restore gene flow between isolated populations must carefully conduct risk assessments, plan for various outcomes using modeling, and conduct ongoing monitoring after restoring gene flow so that adaptive management strategies can be implemented. However, I want to point out that the risks of not restoring gene flow, such as you know, the accelerated uh, loss of genetic diversity, increased inbreeding, potential inbreeding depression, diminished adaptive potential, these risks are often greater than the gene flow associated risks that we've just mentioned. These are a handful of publications that promote the use of gene flow restoration for conservation, but also provide really useful frameworks for weighing up the risks of action and inaction for species conservation. Okay, that's just about it for me from module 1.4. To finish up, I'd like to summarize the main points that I want you to take away from this module. Uh, gene flow is the exchange of genetic material between groups through the migration and interbreeding of individuals. It can increase genetic diversity and decrease inbreeding, which is why it's uh, often used as a conservation initiative, which can be achieved through habitat restoration, construction of uh, various structures, and translocation programs. There are risks to restoring gene flow that must be carefully assessed, but the risk of inaction is often greater than the gene flow associated risks. I hope you found this module useful. For more details on other aspects of conservation genomics, 
and a number of end-to-end -end case studies. Please check out the other modules in this open course. And thank you to all the parties that have contributed to and continue to contribute to TSI.